Thank you for selecting the presentation, How Antibiotics Change the World. My name is Jason Taylor, and I'm a pharmacist at Ascension Providence Rochester Hospital in Rochester. And I'm gonna share with you this presentation today uh, for the Rochester Hills Public Library. And I'm very excited to share this information with you as it is very interesting, kind of going over the history of the revolutionary discovery of antibiotics and how that had an amazing impact on our world. And also share with you a little bit about viruses since uh, the coronavirus pandemic is going on right now. Share some information about that, but the main focus will be on antibiotics and their discovery and the impact that that has had on our world. So let's take a little trip back in history here. You can see the colonial life in early America, uh, small settlements starting to grow here in our country. And just think back for a moment that when people got sick, there was absolutely no way to effectively treat them. And most people succumbed to their illnesses, whatever they got. And drastically different from our world right now, but this is the way it was. People tried to live as, as healthy as they could and be as productive as they could, but if they got ill, there was really not much that could be done for these people, and most people that, that got sick did die. Even if we fast forward from where we were back in the early settlements to 1900, thinking that the you've gotten quite a bit more modern here with the Industrial Revolution just starting to uh, ramp up in America, but really, even in 1900, the death rate, if we look at that due to infectious diseases, was measured at 580 per 100,000 people, quite high. And the death rate in children, as you can see, uh, under the age of five was 30%. And that is astonishing, even if you look to 1900 when they were really tracking uh, rates of death and causes of death. Um, again, at this time, no antibiotics were available to the people of America or around the world. There were no antibiotics at this time. So people were a little bit better with hygiene, but as living conditions got more crowded, cities got bigger, um, diseases were more easily spreading amongst the people and infectious disease had a major toll on the death rate at that time. If we fast forward about 100 years to our current world, now this is 1998, so not uh, all the way up to 2020 yet, but we're about 100 years out from where we were on the last slide, and we compare the death rate due to infectious diseases, now it's down to 34 per 100,000 people. If you remember in 1900, that death rate was 580. So you can see the drastic improvement in death rate due to infectious diseases. And then also if we look at the death rate in children under the age of five, it's down to 1.4%. In 1900, it was 30%. So almost a 29% decrease in the death rate in young children, quite dramatic. And there's a lot of things that go into that. Obviously the one major um, impact that we're gonna look at is the development of antibiotics, but a lot of other things changed in our world in that 100 years as well, with technology, with understanding, with um, understanding how infectious diseases spread, and then uh, introduce, introduction of public health as well. This is interesting to look at as well, uh, the causes of death. When we compare 1900 to 1998, the number one cause of death in 1900 was pneumonia. That could be any kind of pneumonia, bacterial, viral, fungal, influenza especially, but the uh, number one cause of death in 1900 was pneumonia, followed closely behind by tuberculosis, which is another bacterial infection that affects the lungs. Number three on the causes of death in 1900, actually diarrhea. 
and diarrheal and uh, gastrointestinal illnesses. And then number four on the list is heart disease. But it's very interesting to see that these pulmonary causes of death, especially with bacterial, were number one. And we uh, fast forward to 1998, looking at the top causes of death. Number one, heart disease. So diseases caused by high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, all affecting the heart. Number two cause of death, cancer. And number three, stroke. So you can see those causes of death and how they changed where the infectious disease component of the cause of death has gone further down the list and going up on the list are things like heart disease and cancer. And in comparison, we have uh, all the way down to number six is where pneumonia falls in 1998 as causes of death. And if, even if you fast forward and look at the data to now, if you look from 1998 all the way up to present, the causes of death are still the same. You have heart disease, cancer, and stroke. This is a very interesting slide to take a look at, and it looks at a number of things. Uh, if you look at the x-axis on the bottom, you have the year. So starting all the way back with uh, records from 1770, and it goes all the way through to 2015. And if you look at the y-axis, you can see the life expectancy in number of years. So for a long time, you can see from the 1700s up until about the mid 1900s, the, the life expectancy was about 30 to 40 years of age. And then you can see a dramatic increase in life expectancy, which is still on the way up past 70 years of age. And this, this graph also tracks the life expectancy based on region of the world. So you can see North America there in green at the top. And you can see in the blue, uh, much lower is Africa. And then in the red, also you can see it compares the world life expectancy. And all of them, you can see, have a very dramatic increase from the mid-1900s to present. But you can also compare the different areas of the world and how the life expectancy compares from one region to another. And a lot of things play into that increase in life expectancy, antibiotics being a major factor. But also, when you get to the mid-1900s through present, again, it's that understanding of uh, hygiene, public health, and wellness, and other um, medical advances as well. This graph is very interesting as well. It looks at the crude death rate for infectious diseases in the United States from 1900 all the way up to 1996. So about that 100 year time frame that we're looking at for causes of death. And you can see there's an overall general decline in the crude death rate from infectious diseases over this about 100 year period. And also it plots out on the graph time periods of significant interventions in impact on the death rate. So you can see that the first one on there is when health departments were created. So 40 states have health departments in early 1900, and you see a decrease in the crude death rate for infectious diseases. You can see the next arrow there is the continuous use of chlorine in municipal water supply in the United States. And you can see there is a, a slight decrease, but then there's a, a sharp decline after that. And then very interestingly, you can see a giant spike increase in the death rate of infectious diseases. And that was due to the influenza pandemic of 1918. And you can see that's almost off the charts for the uh, crude death rate. Then again, you have the last human to human transmission of plague. You see a decrease in the death rate the first use of penicillin around 1940, a uh, sharp decline after that. You have the 
vaccines being introduced after that, and then the passage of the Vaccine Assistance Act. And again, all these interventions having a role in decreasing the crude death rate for infectious diseases. Now, if we focus on pneumonia mortality rates in children in the United States over time, you can see that this data is tracking from 1939 to 1995. You can see a very steady decline in mortality rates for children with pneumonia over time. And you can look at versus other causes of death as well for children, both are on the decline, but pneumonia has a very sharp decline in mortality for children over this course of time. We can also look at the tuberculosis death rate over time. And this is going all the way back to about the mid 1700s up until the year 2000. So you can see there was an increase over a period of time and then a steady decrease with a small spike around 1900 and then a very sharp decline starting in the 1950s until the year 2000. And this could be attributed definitely to the development of antibacterial agents uh, specifically focused on treating tuberculosis. And there was a huge push for that in the 1940s and the 1950s to get tuberculosis under control because that was a major cause of infectious diseases death in the United States and around the world. So you can see the impact that that had the creation of those drugs and the programs focused on isolating tuberculosis and what impact that that had on the tuberculosis death rate. So we're going to focus a little bit on bacteria. We're talking about antibiotics and how that revolutionized the world. We have to understand what antibiotics have an impact on and they treat bacterial infections. And there's different kinds of bacteria, and you can see on the, the pictures here on the slide that, that bacteria are often classified by their cell wall, their shape, and how they act. So these are all different types of bacteria, and you can see on the electron microscope how they look different. Some are circle-shaped, some are rod-shaped, some form in clusters, and some form in uh, strings or lines. So we're going to focus a little bit on bacteria and how antibiotics affect different parts of the bacteria. So a little bit on uh, back to biology here. Bacteria are single cell organisms and they exist everywhere in our environment and even in our bodies, on our skin. And not all bacteria are bad. In fact, uh, many are beneficial. They help our digestive system, they protect us, and they keep things in balance in our bodies. But bacteria can also be harmful. So if there's a, a breakdown in the skin or we get an overgrowth of bacteria or bacteria gets into a sterile site in the body, that's when you have infections and that can be harmful and even lead to death. As I mentioned before, bacteria are classified by their shape and by their structure or their cell wall, how they're built. So bacteria can be round, and the name that they call those are cocci. They can be rod-shaped or bacilli, and they're also classified based on the structure of the cell wall. So there's a staining process called Gram staining, and there's uh, two different types of staining that can occur. There's Gram positive, which means the bacteria does not have a cell wall, or it can be gram negative, which means there is a cell wall. And those bacteria each exhibit different types of um, effects when they are stained looking under a microscope. So now when we look at pneumonia in particular, uh, there's a number of causes of pneumonia, which is uh, an infection in the lungs and the respiratory tract. Uh, there are viral causes of pneumonia, which are very common including coronaviruses, influenza viruses, and RSV. Pneumonia can also be caused by bacteria. So there's uh, streptococcal infections, haemophilus infections, and other bacteria that get into the lungs and cause a pneumonia. 
and also can be caused by fungus. So now that we have a little bit of an understanding of what bacteria are and the impact that bacteria can have on our bodies when there's an infection, we can start talking about antibiotics or drugs that act on destroying or disabling bacteria in the body to help treat infections. So for a long time in our history, there were not antibiotics. So that's a relatively new discovery in terms of uh, drug therapy. So up until the early 1900s, there were no antibiotics to treat bacterial infections. And also common uh, misconception is that penicillin was the first antibiotic, which it was actually not. It was kind of more famous discovery, but it was not the first antibiotic that was discovered or created. The first one that was actually created was a compound called arsphenamine. It was marketed under the trade name of salvarsan. And this was actually derived from synthetic clothing dye which was actually built around arsenic. So they took arsenic, they added uh, different components to it and created a molecule. And it was developed by a man named Paul Ehrlich and it was first synthesized in 1907. And the main focus of this drug was to treat syphilis, which was a very serious infection at the time. And you can see from the picture there that the drug in the glass ampule has a yellow color to it. So again, this was a uh, initially created as a synthetic dye for clothing and textiles. And then it was experimented on in patients that had infections to see if it would treat those infections. And it did actually have some, out, some beneficial outcomes for that. So that was the first antibiotic that was created. So now we get to talk about penicillin. So this is Sir Alexander Fleming in his lab in 1928 when he accidentally discovered penicillin, which is actually developed from a mold. And this was a contaminant on one of his agar plates. And you can see on the plate there, the Petri dish, the greenish color mold, and then a zone around it where he had bacteria growing that the mold that was actually preventing that bacteria from growing, which led to the question of, could this be used as an antibiotic? So we'll talk a little bit more about penicillin specifically. So as I mentioned, penicillin uh, discovered almost by accident in Fleming's lab. There was a fungus that had contaminated one of his agar plates or Petri dishes that had uh, staphylococcal bacteria bacteria growing on it that he was using for another experiment, uh, there was a zone that he discovered around that fungus that had no bacteria growing. So this led to the discovery that this fungus could be used as an antibiotic or a treatment against bacteria. So the fungus was isolated and it was called penicillium mold. This is a uh, very similar to the mold that would grow on food or fruit that you leave out in the open, it has that greenish color to it. Uh, there's many different kinds of mold that exists in nature and in the environment, uh, but this one was was used because he saw on that plate that it had inhibited the growth of the bacteria that was already on there. So this was a remarkable discovery but Fleming was unable to purify the compound himself. So it's very difficult to take the mold that was growing on either food or on that plate and creating a drug from that. You can't just ingest the mold because it's not gonna work. So that, that mold itself has to be isolated. It has to be purified. It has to be recreated in a form that can be taken by someone that can have a therapeutic benefit. So even though that this was a, an extremely remarkable discovery at the time, he couldn't really do anything with it. He did publish his results in a scientific journal, but it didn't really go anywhere right after his discovery. It was sort of documented and then people moved on. And right after that, the interest in his compound lessened 
in the early 1930s and people started working on other drugs and really kind of stepped away from penicillin. So in the 1930s, there was a lot of work on drugs called sulfa. And this was developed by a German physician named Gerhard Domag in 1935. The drug was called Prontosil. It had a chemical name or classification of KL730. And you can see the structure on the upper right hand part of the slide. That's the, um, the chemical structure of this sulfa drug. And you can see the S in there. It's um, <clears throat> based around the sulfur atom. And this was also created from a synthetic dye compound. So you can see the drug in that glass tube there, and it's a red color. So this was actually initially used as a red dye that was used for clothing and textiles. And again, they, they wondered if this could be used to treat bacterial infections. So this drug was developed, it was purified, and it was found to successfully treat both staphylococcal and streptococcal infections. So those are both uh, different types of bacteria based on how they grow. Uh, you've heard of staph infections, so that's the staphylococcal bacteria. It's a gram-positive bacteria that grows in clusters when you look under the microscope. And streptococcal infections, that's another kind of bacteria, so you, you've heard of strep infections. Again, it's a gram-positive organism. It's round in shape, and they grow in strings. Now, interestingly, um, in this drug discovery, Domag, who created the compound, uh, his own daughter was infected with streptococcal bacteria. Uh, back in that time, uh, needles and other things that were used in surgery and different procedures were not sterilized very well. So she developed a streptococcal infection uh, from an unsterilized needle. She was very sick and he decided to use the drug on his own daughter. Uh, she was administered the drug um, and it did work. It cured her from that strep infection. Uh, but of note, her skin did turn red from using the drug because it, it is a, a dye after all. So she did have red colored skin after being administered the drug. For his efforts in developing this drug, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1939. And after that, he turned his efforts to focusing on tuberculosis, which was a very serious disease at the time. And then after that, he also went on to develop a drug called isoniazid, which is still used in tuberculosis therapy to this day in combination with other drugs. So also he created a metabolite of prontosil, which was called sulfanilamide, which quickly went to market. And sulfa drugs are still used today to treat bacterial infections. Not these drugs in particular, but sulfa drugs are still used to treat infections. So that's very uh, remarkable. So in the late 1930s, interest started to return to penicillin. So after the sulfa drugs had been discovered and created and used to treat infections, people started to think about what next, what other agents can we use to treat infections? So they recalled the work that Fleming did. They were reading his paper that he published and people really started to set to work on purifying penicillin to use it therapeutically to treat infections. So we go to Oxford University here in 1939, and there was a team that was assembled specifically to focus on penicillin to extract a drug from the mold that was growing, to purify it, and to use it therapeutically. And then we have on May 25th, 1939, they did an experiment with the extracted penicillin that they had created. And they took eight mice that were injected with streptococcal bacteria causing an infection. And then four of those mice that were injected with the strep, they also injected a dose of penicillin. The next morning, they found that the four untreated mice were dead and the four treated mice were still alive. 
So they knew that the penicillin that was injected as well had a beneficial effect on that bacterial infection. And this is quite remarkable as well. In February 1949, not long after that first experiment was done, they had actually treated the first patient with penicillin. So a remarkable timeline going from uh, about mid-1939 to early 1941, going from a rudimentary trial, as they did, to actually treating a patient that would be almost unheard of in today's day and age with the experimental process that we have in clinical trials and uh, different phases and different experiments that have to be done before a drug can come to market. Back then, it was much quicker, uh, also much less um, safeguards that were put in place to protect people than they are now. But the first patient was treated with penicillin in February of 1941. So the Oxford team that assembled to extract penicillin and to create a drug from it uh, were successful in creating a very small amount of penicillin that could be used to treat patients, but the technology that they were using, they could not mass produce penicillin uh, due to World War II that was going on at the time. Efforts were focused on the war and not on creating drugs and the processes needed to create large amounts of drug. So the team then traveled to the United States in June of 1941 and started working on new techniques of growing the mold so that they could create enough of the mold to make drug from that. And then by September 1943, there was enough penicillin to actually meet the needs of all the allied forces. So in the period of two years, they went from not having enough drug to having drug to treat thousands upon thousands of people in the military. Uh, a company called Merck, which is a drug company, filed a patent on the production technique of creating penicillin. And then other companies as well started following suit and producing penicillin as well. So they found a drug that worked very well against bacteria. They created techniques to grow the mold in large quantities and also to purify the drug and to create enough drug that could actually be used on patients. In a very short period of time, created very large amounts of drug that was therapeutically useful. So after the creation of sulfa and penicillin in the late 1930s, early 1940s, other processes and production techniques were discovered. And so now we move into the 1940s and the 1950s, we see a dramatic increase in the amount of other drugs that were also used to treat bacterial infections. So drug called streptomycin was created after that, which was used for a very long period of time. Chloramphenicol, erythromycin, which is still on the market. Vancomycin, which is kind of our mainstay of many bacterial infections to this day, and many others. So after the creation of those two or three key antibiotics and figuring out how to mass produce them and create them in a usable form, that opened the door to the creation of other antibiotics used to treat other infections. And it just kind of took off from there. So if we fast forward to today, we have well over 100 different antibiotics on the market around the world. So we went from the 1940s, where we had about two or three antibiotics, to now, where we have over 100 different antibiotics useful on the market. And it's estimated that there's over 150 million prescriptions for antibiotics written every year. So truly remarkable. Um, looking at the different types of infections, the different types of bacteria, and the creation and discovery of these different antibiotics to treat different infections is really remarkable. While the discovery of antibiotics has been truly remarkable and had an amazing impact on our world, we need to consider the next step. So there is a problem 
with using too many antibiotics. There's a threat of what's called antimicrobial resistance. So when we treat a patient with antibiotics and we destroy that bacteria, the bacteria have a way of promoting their survival. So if we attack a key component of the bacteria, for instance, the cell wall with a drug, the bacteria over time and exposure to that drug will create different mechanisms to combat against that destructive part of the antibiotic. So the bacteria will evolve and will develop different mechanisms to promote their own survival. So the more that we use antibiotics and the more that we use the same type of antibiotics, the bacteria that are in our bodies and that are around in our environment will change and they become more difficult to treat, so much so that certain antibiotics can't be used anymore. And that's what we call the term resistance. So we worry what you've probably heard of in the news called superbugs. So they are bacteria that have changed based on exposure to antibiotics that we can't use our current antibiotics that we have to treat them anymore because the bacteria don't respond to them because they've come up with mechanisms to defend themselves against the antibiotics. So things you may have heard of out there are MRSA or MRSA, VRE, C. diff, and then Visa and Versa. So these are different bacteria that have evolved that are now resistant to common antibiotics that we have around. MRSA, you've probably heard of, is the most common one. Uh, and that's simply due to the antibiotics that we were using to treat staph infections. You use them enough over time, the bacteria evolve, and they come up with mechanisms to defend against the drugs we were using. So now we have to come up with a drug to treat MRSA infections, which we did, which is vancomycin. And then now we're starting to see that those bacteria are becoming resistant to the vancomycin and we're having to use different drugs and develop different treatments to treat those bacterial infections because they're becoming resistant. So the bottom line here is that we need to be smart about how we use antibiotics and not overuse them so that we can keep this resistance problem in check. And the CDC reported not long ago that there is an estimated 35,900 deaths due to resistant bacteria and fungi each year. And these are deaths attributable to bacterial infections that couldn't, <clears throat> could not be treated because the antibiotics were not working anymore due to resistance. And that's a large number. So the question is, what can we do? The first thing is we need to be aware of the problem. We need to be aware that uh, resistance is out there, that yes, it's amazing that we have antibiotics that treat a number of diseases and that we're so much better off now than we were 50, 60, 80 years ago. But we need to be careful that we don't run into the problem of we don't have drugs to treat infections because of all the resistance that's going on. So we need to be smart about antibiotic use. We need to recognize that antibiotics don't treat colds and flu and viruses. They only treat bacterial infections. And that if you do get a course of antibiotics prescribed by your doctor, that you complete the full course of antibiotics, that you don't take two or three days worth and you start feeling better, and then you stop the antibiotics, and then that bacterial infection can come back because it was not appropriately treated the first time. We can practice good hygiene habits, so hand washing, uh, not touching our face, trying to prevent disease transmission as much as possible. We can get our flu shot every year, especially the young and the elderly, to prevent infections and complications from the flu. And hospitals, this is where I come in, 
is practice good stewardship with antibiotics. And this is something that we focus on uh, at all the hospitals. And that is making sure that we're using the appropriate antibiotics at the appropriate time. So if someone comes into the hospital and they're sick with a bacterial infection, that we start the appropriate antibiotics for those patients. And then we determine what the infection is, what bacteria is causing it. And then we scale back on the antibiotics and only use the narrow spectrum as possible to treat those infections. So we start out very broad, covering a lot of different things till we find out exactly what's causing the infection. And then we streamline the antibiotics to treat only the bacteria that we know is causing the problem. And the more that we do that, the more that it preserves the antibiotics that we do have available to treat illnesses. And finally, I wanted to mention a little bit about uh, viral concerns. So going on right now in our world, we have the coronavirus pandemic, and this is actually a SARS virus. Uh, it's, there are coronaviruses that exist right now that are not new, but this particular one that causes the disease, COVID-19, is a SARS-CoV-2 virus. And this is a new coronavirus that um, is spreading. It's different than the other coronaviruses that are existing right now and have existed around us. Um, coronaviruses are not new, so they do cause disease. They can cause the common cold. There are many coronaviruses that exist. Um, but this one is a new coronavirus or a novel coronavirus, so that's why it's very concerning. And these viruses spread initially from animals and they cross over to humans and cause an infection. And then from there, they can spread from human to human. And this particular one is spreading very quickly and it spread from animals to humans and then humans to humans causing illness very rapidly. The problem with these kind of viruses and the disease that they cause is that there's no effective treatment. Uh, viruses, there are some drugs that do treat viruses um, uh, for influenza. We know that there's a couple of drugs out there that treat that, like Tamiflu. If you start taking that drug right when you get symptoms of the flu, it can actually lessen the, um, the disease duration of about a day or two if you start taking it early. But those drugs don't appear to be effective against the uh, coronaviruses. So the only care that we can provide patients are supportive. So making sure that they get enough oxygen, making sure that um, they get enough fluids. And then there are some drugs that were experimental that are being used to treat patients with these uh, coronavirus infections, but uh, they're that's very new, trying to discover these treatments. There's not very many patients that have undergone the trials. So we're kind of using whatever tools that we have in our disposal to help them and to treat them as best we can. But there is no effective treatment at this time. That's why it's so serious. So with these viruses, the best success that we can have with preventing illness is using smart hygiene. It's making sure that we're washing our hands constantly, that we're not touching our face or our eyes or our nose. Uh, when the viruses are out and about and they're spreading from person to person, they enter our body through those parts only. They enter through the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. And once they enter into our body, they start to replicate, and they replicate for a period of days, even a week. And then after that, when there's enough virus that's in the body, it starts to cause disease and cause the uh, symptoms of the viral infection. So the best thing that we can do to try to prevent the virus from even entering our body is to make sure that we're using good hygiene practices. Um, the only way we can get it is if we happen to touch the virus on a surface 
and then we touch our face and introduce it that way, or it can spread via respiratory droplets. So if someone coughs or sneezes and they have the virus in their body, the virus comes out in those droplets and then we can pick it up into our body either by touch or by breathing it in if we're in very close proximity to somebody that has those vir viral droplets in the air. So that's why uh, hand hygiene is very important, why distancing is important, and why covering our face is important, especially if we're the ones that have the virus so that we can prevent that from spreading out in those droplets. Uh, transmission can occur off surfaces, so if there is viral uh, particles on a surface and we touch that, we can bring that into our body if we're not careful. So hand washing is extremely important. Don't touch your face while you're out and about. Keep your distance. And also very important here is the development of vaccines to help us induce immunity in our bodies. So we know with the flu vaccine or with the flu virus, it's very important that uh, we get the vaccine out there every year. It changes a little bit year to year. Uh, based on the, the type of virus that's out there. But we know that that's critically important is that the more flu vaccine that we get out there into the population, uh, the better immunity that we have as a whole and prevent uh, the severity of illness from the flu each year. And the same thing will be true with this coronavirus is that we develop a vaccine uh, and we give it to many, 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 many people around the world. And then we increase our immunity together as a whole against the virus so that if we do get exposed to it, our bodies are familiar with it and, and can fight it more effectively. And that vaccine hopefully will be coming out soon, soon after they, um, it's already been created, but uh, now the testing has to, has to be undertaken in clinical trials, make sure that it's safe, make sure that it's effective, and then it can begin to be produced and then distributed to uh, the population so that we can get it out there. So this concludes my presentation on how antibiotics revolutionized the world. I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you for selecting this presentation to listen to, and I hope that you have a, a new understanding of just how amazing it was, the discovery of antibiotics, and how it, it did completely revolutionize our world, and how it did so in a relatively short period of time. So thank you very much for listening. And if you do have any questions, I would invite you to send those to the Rochester Hills Public Library, and hopefully they can get those questions to me so that I could answer them for you. Uh, but thank you very much for your attendance, and have a great day.